Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Joyce Strasser, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Stillman School of Business here at Seton Hall University. And it is my great honor to formally welcome you here tonight for our special event, A Conversation with Betty Minetta. Now, as you know, at the Stillman School, it is our tradition to come together regularly as a community to reflect on our core values of integrity and professionalism. Our convocations feature speakers who address the challenges of ethical leadership through their own lenses, through their experiences, both personally and professionally. We are very committed to our educational philosophy of transforming concepts into business practice, so into making the lessons of the classroom come to life. And one of the best ways to do that is events like this, where our community has the opportunity to hear from and learn from business leaders like Ms. Betty Minetta, President and CEO of Argent Associates. Now this year, our convocation program is very special because we're collaborating with three distinguished organizations. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by Seton Hall's Joseph A. Unanaway Latino Institute, and also by the Financial Women's Association of New Jersey, and I'm very grateful for their support. In addition, we are so honored that our program has been selected by Beta Gamma Sigma the International Honor Society for Business Schools Accredited by AACSB International for inclusion in its Meet the Leaders of Business series. This means that this program will be streamed live to participating BGS chapters at business schools across the globe. Now let me now introduce Denise Oyer, Director of the Joseph A. Unanue Latino Institute, who will give you some background on our speaker. Prior to joining our Seton Hall community, Denise earned international acclaim as a 20-year veteran of the television news industry. She served both as a news anchor and a correspondent. Her coverage of world events, including presidential electives, elections, sorry, I was thinking curriculum, presidential elections, the 9-11 terror attacks, and the Oklahoma City bombings earned her five Emmys, nine more Emmy nominations, five ACE Awards, two Gracie Awards, and the Edward R. Murrow Award for Excellence in Investigative Reporting. It is not at all surprising that Hispanic Business Magazine named Denise one of the 100 most influential Hispanic personalities in the U.S. Please help me give a warm welcome to Denise Oyer. Thank you. Thank you very much for those lovely words, Dean Strauser. Good evening to everyone. Good evening to all of you. The Joseph A. Unanue Latino Institute has been part of Seton Hall University since 2005. We're here for you. We offer scholarships, mentorship programs. We bring extraordinary speakers to Seton Hall, like Betty Manetta, this time in conjunction with the Stillman School of Business. And we also engage in servant leadership. Check us out at our webpage or visit us as Fahey246. Now let's get down to business because we're here to he listen to Mrs. Betty Manetta. There's so much to say about her. Her accomplishments are so very impressive. Betty Manetta also carries a message of empowerment, of transformation, of hope. She is the president and the CEO of Argent Associates, which she founded in 1998. Argent Associates is a certified minority and female-owned company, and a proven award-winning systems integrator that delivers logistics, warehousing, and monitoring solutions through state-of-the-art quality systems that provide real-time information. With over 20 years of experience working in the telecommunications industry, including AT&T and Lucent Technologies, Ms. Manetta's mission and proven commitment to collaborating with clients has made a measurable impact, helping customers gain a competitive advantage. 
Under her leadership, Argent Associates was named Ericsson's 2014 Supplier of the Year, a 2014 Top 500 Diversity-Owned Business in the United States, and one of the 5,000 fastest growing private companies by Inc. 500 in 2014. The list goes on and on. Betty served on the President's Expert Council, which advised President G. W. Bush, George W. Bush on international trade matters, as well as the Board of Directors as Vice President of the Minority Business Roundtable in Washington, D.C. These are only two of the many prestigious boards that she serves on both nationally and locally. Born in Argentina, Betty grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She holds a Master of International Studies from Seton Hall University, where she recently received the Beta Gamma Sigma Award for contributing significantly to the vitality and the strength of the economy, combining business achievement with service to humanity. Ms. Manet is also a wife and a mother, no matter how great and complicated her business responsibilities are, she always makes time for her family. Uh, on a personal note, Betty's nothing if not honest and forthright, and of course, she is indefatigable. I personally admire her for giving back to her community and sharing the knowledge and experience of her remarkable life in order to inspire others. Let's give a warm round of applause to Mrs. Betty Manetta. Hi, Erin. Hi. Okay, so I'm gonna just give you some actions to do. I just do the first thing that comes to mind. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Look at my hair. Oh my God. Show me what it looks like to fight like a girl. <laughs> now throw like a girl. Aw. My name is Dakota and I'm 10 years old. Show me what it looks like to run like a girl. Throw like a girl. Fight like a girl. What does it mean to you when I say run like a girl? It means run fast as you can. So do you think you just insulted your sister? No. I mean, yeah, insulted girls, but not my sister. Is like a girl a good thing? Actually, I don't know what it really, if it's a bad thing or a good thing. It sounds like a bad thing. It sounds like you're trying to humiliate someone. So when they're in that vulnerable time, between 10 and 12, how do you think it affects them when somebody uses like a girl as an insult? I think it definitely drops their self-confidence and um, really puts them down because during that time, they're already trying to figure themselves out. And when somebody says, you hit like a girl, it's like, well, what does that mean? Because they think they're a strong person. It's kind of like telling them that they're weak and they're not as good as them. And what advice do you have to young girls who are told they run like a girl, kick like a girl, hit like a girl, swing like a girl? Keep doing it, because it's working. If somebody else says that running like a girl, or kicking like a girl, or shooting like a girl is something that you shouldn't be doing, that's their problem. Because if you're still scoring, and you're still getting to the ball on time, and you're still being first, you're doing it right. It doesn't matter what they say. I mean, yes, I kick like a girl, and I swim like a girl and I walk like a girl and I wake up in the morning like a girl because I am a girl and that is not something that I should be ashamed of so I'm going to do it anyway that's what they should do if I asked you to, to run like a girl now would you do it differently I would run like myself would you like a chance to redo it Why can't run like a girl also mean win the race?
I hope you liked my commercial, because I am a girl. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I'm Betty Mineta, and president and CEO of Argent Associates. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Dean, Denise, uh, Mike Reuter, the Leadership Development Honor Program, uh, to have this Hispanic business-owned girl, okay, maybe I'm a little older than a girl, but uh, growing my business like a girl, uh, con contributing to the economy like a girl, and uh, sharing my story today with you like a girl. So thank you all for coming. So um, I know this week, uh, you know, we've been celebrating the month here um, for Hispanic Heritage Month, and I, as they said, I am from Argentina, so I am a Hispanic woman-owned business. And uh, before I do get started, though, because we are in the campuses of uh, Seton Hall University, and I see a lot of students in the audience, um, this is about education. And I'm going to teach you about three different things, and we're going to cover three different topics. One is history. Another one is going to be about statistics. And then a little bit of business and marketing. So um, there will be a quiz afterwards. And I don't know if the dean told you, but you all better be prepared. So anyway, um, it is the Hispanic Heritage Month. And uh, Monday, uh, October 13th, which is really October 12th, when we celebrate Dia de la Gaza, Day of the Race, which uh, here we celebrate Columbus Day and part of the history lesson. So. Uh, when we started out, uh, many parts of the world celebrate Dia de la Gaza because it's when Europe, or the Renaissance Europe, uh, entered the Americas, the New World. And so Columbus first came here. He thought he was in Indies, in the Indies, and uh, he landed in the Bahamas, right? Uh, and then Cortes later, um, 30 years later, I think it was, and don't hold me to that, but he landed in Mexico. And so hence the transformation, the, uh, the inclusion of the Latinos into the Americas. And so that is part of your history lesson and why we're here today, uh, to recognize and talk about the accomplishments of the Hispanic community and about some of the businesses. So now a little bit of the statistics. Okay, uh, and then I'm going to get into the real meat of the story. So, uh, strengthening our economy and, uh, and looking at the labor force, uh, we, we see a lot of Latinos out there. And, um, and so now I have to put my glasses on because that's where the girl ends. Um, so, again, the strength of the American economy is linked to the Latino workforce. So the Latinos are the fastest growing segment of the American workforce. 23.3 million uh, represent about 16% of our labor force. By 2020, one of every three employees will be Hispanic. Number of Hispanic-owned businesses, 4.3 million, with total revenues of $539 billion. The purchase power that comes from our community is valued at 1 billion with 52 million Hispanics. Again, those are very astonishing numbers and to me very important because that is why uh, I love to do what I do, why I'm in business, because we are the future, the voice, and, and we represent our economic growth here. So let me tell you a little bit about where I started. I grew up in Elizabeth, a uh, very urban area. And uh, my parents came to this country from Argentina. My sister and I uh, were with them. Uh, we were young. And, uh, you know, they didn't speak the language. They, they came and they, my father, I think, graduated high school. My mom never did. Uh, but to them, it was important to get an education. And so we went through school, Catholic school in Elizabeth. Um, eventually, um, got a job at Western Electric and worked my way up. 
Uh, actually, I came to, uh, I did my college, both my undergrad and my master's. My master's here at Seton Hall and all through tuition aid because I knew the importance of education. I knew the importance of having a college degree. Now, my parents felt that it would be best for me to go get a job, work in a factory, and I'm glad I didn't because they no longer exist. Uh, but back then, they, they, we did have manufacturing in New Jersey. Um, but anyway, so, so I started the journey working and really, uh, you know, doing the best I could, growing up in an urban area, working in a company like AT&T, uh, working with a lot of very prestigious uh, individuals, right? Uh, people that went to Yale, Wharton School of Business, Thunderbird, um, and here I was, a little Latina, you know, from Elizabeth. Um, and yet, I said, I'm going to do it because I can do it. Uh, I will do it. And uh, I continued to work hard uh, because nothing comes easy. You have to work for what you want. Uh, and so I did, working my way up AT&T. Uh, eventually, I was able to get into the international arena. So I ran uh, the country desk for the Middle East and Africa. And I'm like, okay, I can speak fluent Spanish, I can do the Caribbean, Latin America, but no, uh, they chose me to go to uh, the Middle East and Africa where I did a lot of business in Cairo. And I loved it because I learned, I was challenged. I love the challenge uh, and I did great. And I kinda, my, my Hispanic background really worked well because as many of you who are Latinos know that um, you know, my father was the ruling body and what he said went. And when he said, go get me this, you did it. And so um, in Cairo, and as many of you may know in the Middle East, the women uh, are also, so I sat there in my chair, took my notes, did what I had to, and I gained a lot of great friendships, which I still have today in business. Um, in 98, I decided to leave and run my own business. Uh, one of the things, the, the, the success for me was the ability to learn and, and capture those things that I learned in, in working with AT&T because I had to work through so many different types of diverse backgrounds, right? We had, um, and then later on I did go to the Cala region uh, working in Mexico, Colombia, and, uh, and that was great because at least I could speak the language. But just think about all the different things that you have to deal with. Um, the, 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 the different cultures, the different people, how they look, what they perceive of you. But one thing that never, that I never wavered is your integrity, is your professionalism. Everything I did, I always did it with professionalism, with ethics, because that's the only way to win the race. So later when I started my company, Argent Associates, uh, back in 98, I formed it uh, with a mentor uh, called Annexter. It's a, a, a company that does distribution of telecommunication products. And to this day, 16 years later, we are still partners in business. And the one thing that they know, I will never do anything unethical. I am a professional all the time. And I will always be a true partner because they helped me grow my business. First year in business, we did $110 million worth of business. Not too shabby for a girl from Elizabeth, right? Uh, but we did it because we were smart, we had a plan, we had a vision, we had a strategy. And so that continued throughout my career with, uh, with Argent Associates. About three years ago, I started another company called Associar. And that is a partnership with a Japanese company called Fujitsu. And um, as you can imagine, uh, you know, two blending uh, different cultures, working great. First year in business, last year we did about 33 million. Again, the, the underlining and the key to success has been the ability to work in an ethical, uh, um, professional, and most importantly, uh, in the type of environment that gives everyone um, ownership and also confidence that you can do what you set to do. And so, so the journey continues. Uh, I have a lot of my employees here and, um, and, and associates and family members as well. Uh, one of the things that, um, that now is, is challenging many companies like myself is this transformation of the Workforce 2020. So, so the transformation, the Workforce 2020 really is looking at how do we 
uh, pivot and change in this new environment, right? Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of Workforce 2020. Um, it's what a lot of corporations and, and companies and entrepreneurs like myself struggle with, and that is how do you start looking at the future? Um, devices, technology, convergence of technology, convergence of, of different types of industries, smart cars, smart buildings, uh, smart dogs, you know, everything is now technology based and so how do you take that and pivot and grow your business? Those are the challenges I have today as a woman, uh, as a entrepreneur taking that vision that I had, because it was telecommunications, it was the old wireline business, now going into mobility, now going into small cells, now going into smart devices, and, and having the workforce that can pivot with you, that can grow with you. So you have to retool. You have to change the way you do things. And, and tomorrow I'm doing a talk at AT&T for their uh, group called Asemos, which is the organization of employees because they too have uh, a challenge. They have to pivot and grow themselves to be the workforce of 2020. And again, it's a challenge because some of them come with their own legacy. They, they, they do things the way they've done it for 20, 30 years, and now all of a sudden we're going to a whole new different workforce. Um, no different than you all. When you graduate, you're going to be going into a workforce that's going to look a lot different than when I graduated college. Uh, it's going to look a lot different, but you're going to be there more prepared than we ever were because you have a lot of the skills. You have the foundation and you have the right university that is giving you that foundation, that, that professionalism, because whatever you do, no matter whether it's in school, or whether it's in work or it's running your own business, it all depends on you because the more power you have, the more you hold on to your ethics and you do things the way it should be done, people will respect you. You will continue to grow. And so Workforce 2020 for me means how do I get and retool my employees? Uh, the workforce, the big corporations, they have to be able to now look at their workforce and make sure that they are as diverse as their consumers, as their, the people that they serve. So many of you are going to be their consumers. And then how do they attract you, right? They want to attract the right talent for the future. So companies, and, and I'm sure you all read it, Google and other are looking for talent, and they're looking in the halls of the universities because here lies the future of the workforce 2020. And so are you ready to take the challenge? And you gotta be able to take technology to the next level. You also have to create your own uh, blue ocean, if you will, now that we're all in the uh, blue today. Uh, the blue ocean is creating your own destiny. So sometimes um, being an entrepreneur may not be an option, um, but you know, you have to create your own space. And so I don't know if any of you read the book, but the blue ocean is taking maybe sometimes that something that is uh, more normal or commercialized and turn it into something new. And I'll give you a real brief example. When you look at Cirque du Soleil, they took what used to be just circus and they revolutionized it into their own little blue ocean. Then they started bundling in artists like, uh, you know, Michael Jackson, Jackson and the Beatles, and they did the Cirque du Soleil around these artists. So that is creating your own destiny. That is creating your own future. So it takes that kind of vision and drive to be able to take the challenge to do the Workforce 2020. So again, I think as Argent and now as an associate, I have a challenge. I have a challenge to get to the next level. But I'm prepared. I'm prepared because it comes through learning, it comes through uh, research, it comes through making sure that we retain the right talent and make sure that we're very technology savvy. We have to use technology to the best of our abilities to help us grow our business because sometimes you can't do it organically, you need a little of assistance. So I do have a little um, a demo for you of something that is very, you know, I think iPads, a lot of people may have iPads. So we have my little IB10 robot right here. So when my chief operating officer or someone can't come with me to, um, to a meeting, he can be there live because through technology, and I can't let her talk 
through it because she's too close to the microphone. You'll get some noise. But again, something so simple as an iPad, putting on a roller so that now virtually you can be at any meeting. I can be in New Jersey and I have a facility in Texas. My little IB10 robot can come and spook everybody at their desk. Uh, but really, to have meaningful meetings, right? To be able to do things uh, live. So again, something like this demonstrates that through technology, you can do a lot of cool things. Um, we have site surveys. We have, uh, in the telecommunication world, uh, we, uh, we do site surveys, and, and people are walking, and, and do, this can also assist. You can have an engineer in New Jersey, and they could be doing a site survey in San Francisco, and he doesn't have to be there with my other technicians. He could be there looking and also guiding and coaching. So now you use technology to, uh, to enhance your workforce. So again, um, I think these are kind of the little tidbits that I wanted to leave you. Um, I, I didn't want to talk too much about Argent because um, I think uh, there's a lot of material out there. And, uh, and again, I'm, I'm very humble, but I'm very proud of what we accomplished. But I'm more proud of, of being part of this organization, part of the university, part of the Board of Regents, because through this, I can continue to do more and give more. And this is my passion. I love to leave a little legacy behind. And I thank you all for coming. And I'll take any questions that any of the audience may have at this time. Thank you. Okay. Karen Borak. Hi, Karen. Thank you very much. Very wonderful discussion. Uh, what's uh, What's happening with health care with your firm in light of uh, the Affordable Health Care Act? The health care in Dallas? Are you? I, I can't hear the what? Oh, Obamacare with my firm. Well, uh, with us, because we've always, every, all my employees have had uh, Ob um, health care. So um, I don't see much of an impact for us. Uh, I do about, um, I think, uh, the employees put in 20, we cover 80%, we have um, all the coverages. So it really had very little impact on my business uh, so far, so far, because remember, uh, it doesn't really kick in until later uh, for a few years for now, or at least next year, but for us, um, it has not had a major impact on my business, so thank you. And, and in Texas, um, I think they have a much better program, and uh, I think my costs there are a lot less than they are here for healthcare. Betty, Paul, Alexander, thank you very much for coming. I think one of the things you didn't mention, which I, I think must have been a big factor in your success, is your ability to deal cross-culturally and with very diverse people. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, working with diverse people? Right, and okay. across cultures. And across cultures. Um, yes and, and no. Um, I found it, for me, it was always very easy because I grew up in a very mixed community. Um, so in Elizabeth, um, it was always very uh, a diverse community. I went to school in a very diverse community. Um, working in business is a little bit different. Um, I think that especially in a very telecommunication focused industry where um, there is a difference, and I don't think it's just diversity, I think it's um, male and female. Uh, I think that's more of a challenge for, for us in our industry than there is about diversity. Um, I think that they've embraced diversity, and they do so now, whether, um, and, and I think there are all these magazines that are coming out now for the top 50 corporations that uh, are good to work for because of their diversity embracement, um, the, uh, the, the boards of co corporations that have diversity embraced in there. I think there's still a big, um, to me, the biggest challenge is male-female. 
Uh, I think that's where you see that it's still not a level playing field. Um, and especially in certain industries. I w walk into some of these meetings and it's predominantly 80% male, 20% uh, female. And then the diversity piece uh, is shifting. now. Uh, as I said, I spend a lot of time in Texas. I just flew in from, from Plano uh, earlier this afternoon. And there you see a whole different change. Uh, Plano, Richardson, Dallas is becoming a very diverse community. Most of the engineers are coming from China, from Pakistan, from India, uh, from Korea, from Vietnam. It's a very diverse, so what used to be a predominantly Hispanic community, is, is really changing, and, um, and it's no longer what it looked like before. And that's because the richness of the schools. Uh, I think there's a lot of more jobs available, and, and especially around technology, and that's why I keep telling everyone, you know, they're not smarter than we are. The, the kids that are coming in to take some of these jobs, especially engineering, RF engineering, they're not smarter. They just have, um, they just know that that's what they need to study. But we can enhance that, and there are programs, and we are doing some stuff online for RF engineering because we don't need... The corporate world is uh, a good benefit for entrepreneurs, or would you recommend just going straight into starting a company after college? That's a good question. So my recommendation, personally, is to, to work in a corporation to get your feet wet first. Uh, I think the key to my success was I had 20 years working in corporate America. And so when I started my business, I kind of knew a little bit about the industry. Uh, I knew where to go for, for resources. I knew how to create a mentor-protege program. I knew what, where, where there were gaps in the industry and what I could do to fill those gaps. Uh, I knew how to put together a business plan and get money for free because I did all the research and I saw other companies doing it. So my personal opinion, unless you already have a family business, uh, to get to work in a corporation and get your feet wet is always better than to jump into it unless you have a lot of money and you could do it. Or unless you have, you know, it, it, there are people that have great ideas, that are great inventors. Uh, never stop doing that. You could still do both. You could still be um, working and tinking on something if you're good at creating apps or, or creating a technology like the IB10 here. Uh, never give that up because there's plenty of money for that, for, for um, uh, you know, people that have these talents. But if you wanted to start a business and you really didn't know where, I would suggest that you first work someplace get your feet wet, understand where your passion is, and then pursue whatever opportunity or uh, line of business that you, you like to do. Did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I did. Uh, Michael Ojo, thank you for coming. I think you're a big inspiration for all CUNY Hall students and uh, faculty members trying to be entrepreneurs as myself. Uh, so a question I also have is that how do you dif differentiate yourself against competitors because that's always something. You're not the only one who does what you do. That's right. Many other people out there. So how do you make yourself solid for your client? And two, how, how have you been so sustainable since 98, especially through 2008, 2009, where you know, a lot of businesses were just going bust uh, just due to the economy? How have you been able to be so successful? Great questions. Two very great questions. So one, how do I differentiate myself? Because yes, the competition's out there and they're just as good as I am and, and they can do what I can do. I think what sets us apart and our key differentiator is our innovation. Um, I think our technology platform, our quality tools, uh, and, and how we repurpose things. So there's a lot of things that we do. We already have three products in the works. Uh, one is called the uh, Converged Workstation 2.0, which is being tested right now in the labs. Um, we have uh, tracking of assets to do the whole chain of, of custody for um, major assets, okay? Now, now that's not, nothing new, but it's, it's new to some corporations that never even thought of it. Utilizing your smartphone to be able to um, do uh, safety and quality checks for remote employees, right? These are little things that they never thought of, and they say, wow, we should have thought of that. 
And I think when you have a telecom or a technology platform, your costs can be reduced. So then you become economically competitive. And I believe in metrics. So what you measure, you, you will do better. So we measure everything. So our quality and performance, so I'm ISO and TL9000 certified. That means that we have to do all the quality uh, processes in order to do business with Fortune 500. And now we're in the process of getting R2 certification, which is the sustainability piece of it, um, for re reclamation, e-waste, and things like that. Because as we're deploying technology, we're also removing some old stuff. So you also have to, so you have to be well balanced. And I think what helped us during that time where, when there was a major lull and a lot of companies were going out of business, we diversified our portfolio. A lot of companies did not. Um, I knew that you couldn't put your eggs in one basket. You can't be just telecommunications. And we knew that there was this whole convergence happening. So we started shifting. We did a lot of work with uh, aerospace. We started moving more into government space. We started moving into healthcare. So again, the same applications that we use for telecommunication customers, those are the same applications that can be used in, in other verticals. So we just started expanding. And so when you have a lull, one, another one picks up. Um, and now what's happening, our government spending is going down. There's not a lot more DOD uh, contracts, but now the commercial side is picking up. So you need to have a balanced portfolio, no different than your own portfolio for, for your, um, your own personal uh, gains. So I think that's what really helped us. And, and I always did something working for Western Electric, any of you that remember. So at Western Electric, when the times were good, we couldn't spend money. We had to save it. When times were bad, we were out there making sure that you're promoting yourself and, and you're, and that's what I did. So when there was a lull, you know, when things were, we were making a lot of money, we we're putting it away and trying to be uh, cautious because you don't need to go out there. It's when times are bad that you need to be out there promoting yourself, marketing yourself, branding the image. And so that's what we did during those bad times. So they say, okay, so you're, you're around, you're still healthy, good. We like companies that can sustain themselves during the bad times. So that is uh, one of the things that I did personally, because I knew that uh, when times are bad, they get real ugly in telecom. Any other questions? So um, working in Cairo was, uh, I mean, they are very, very humble, nice people. And I think that I, one of my, my boss was very smart, Greg Peters, and my husband knows him well. Uh, he said, do your homework. Read about the Koran. Read about their culture. Um, understand what, you, what you're getting into before you go there, because you don't want to be in and I hate to say this, sometimes we're ugly Americans. We go someplace and we really don't understand their culture. So when you go into somebody's house, you have to understand their culture. And one of the things is I, I did that very well. I knew that as a woman, you can't be aggressive. And so, you know, um, I always sat quietly when they asked me uh, and they became very close friends. Uh, I think the other thing was you always ask about their children. How's your family? Before you start business, like, you know, you have these people going boom. Okay, so what do we sign the con You don't do that. You start out with how's the family? How's your son? And, you know, you do these things and that's what helps create that, that, um, that un unique, uniqueness, okay? Because you don't want to look like you're very aggressive, and especially for a woman. Uh, I think we have to work even harder at uh, not being aggressive. And, and back then, we did have two women CEOs. Uh, one was Carly Fiorina, another one was, um, uh, oh, God, I can't remember her name. But both of them very uh, aggressive women and you know sometimes it turned off our customers you know but they were, they were CEOs and that's what they knew so um, I wasn't a CEO I was a much lower level so uh, but that is something that you have to oh, do your research before you go anywhere to do business and you know the the world is our is, is our, 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 our is our is anything for us to do out there so globally uh, it's a great opportunity, but do your research, do your homework, and uh, make sure that you don't offend anyone.
You're welcome. Any other questions now? Well, I thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, wait. This, yes. Has my integrity ever been tested? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, um, I've had several partnerships uh, with other companies, and uh, you quickly learn that uh, you got to be very careful because it can taint your reputation, and I worked so hard at making sure that our reputation was never tainted and your integrity is always intact. And there were many people, many companies that believe in short-term gains. They want to quickly go in, make a buck. And you know what? That's good for them. That wasn't me. Uh, I believe in the long-term uh, relationships. I think that you have to walk the talk. You have to represent your company because now I represent not only myself. At one time, it was just me and, and my secretary. That's one thing. But you have a lot of people now counting on you. So your integrity... Is, is so important because the last thing you want to do is have to tell your employees that we are going to sh shut down the doors, we're done, let's move on. People, um, I have a lot of workers that are um, the first uh, generation uh, going to school, first uh, you know, children coming to the United States. It is so beautiful to see them buy their first house, buy their first car, and if I can help them, I do. Um, you know, that is so, to me, so moving. And so when you say, you know, when somebody tells me, hey, we can do this and you could take shortcuts, there are no shortcuts in life. There are no shortcuts in business because you may be able to take a shortcut, but it's not going to be longevity. So, um, yeah, we have a lot of those companies out there. And, and trust me, some of them still do well. And I'm like, God bless. Not me. I will not, repu I will not uh, taint my reputation, nor do I want to do anything to hurt my employees. So, good question. Yes. Hi, my name is Caitlin Conroy, and my question is, were there any deciding factors that went into moving from working for, I guess, other people to starting your own business, and how would you inspire other women to do that themselves? So, um, great question also. Uh, I always did a little entrepreneurial stuff, even when I worked at AT&T. So uh, I used to run a concession at the Ritz Theater in Elizabeth. Um, so I did that for many years, made a lot of money. Uh, bought my condo down the shore because I did that on the side while working at AT&T, while going to school. Uh, and then I also had a little construction company on the side um, with some old friends of mine in Elizabeth, and that didn't pass. So I always tinkered in. I knew that that was something that I wanted to do. And I think it wasn't until my sister uh, said, you know what, I think I'm, I'm going to start a family, and why don't we start something together? And I talked to my husband, and I said, hey, you know, you think I could um, start my own business? Because I saw this whole... Uh, I was working in supplier diversity at, um, at, at Lucent, and I did that for a few years along with other, some other stuff, but that was one of my jobs, and I, I never knew what supplier diversity was. And then I saw all these companies that really didn't understand um, the telecommunications sectors, didn't understand the industry, but yet they were making money, and they were doing business because of either their race or their sex, and I was like, geez, well, I'm Hispanic. I can do this too. So I talked to my boss, and I said, hey, if I started my own business, I know where you have challenges, uh, and I'm Latina. If I get certified um, as a woman and as a minority, would you do business with me? And he said, yeah. So that's what drove me to do it. Um, and then once I did, it was like, okay, you go to the bank and you try to get a loan. Okay, I need $50 million because I'm going to be a value-added reseller for this company, and they are vouching. And they said, are you crazy? <laughs> so that's when I went to Annexter, and we formed this partnership, uh, a mentoring protege program. So they would fund it. I was doing all the front office, back office work. They would do the warehousing and logistics. But that's how I got started. And I knew that you, you could only do this for a little while because I, didn't, I wanted to pass the red face test. I don't want anybody to think this was just a pass through. Okay, and there's many companies out there that continue to do just pass-throughs because they just write it on their, on their paper. No, I wanted to grow from there, and I told them, I said, you know, you're mentoring me so that I can do this on my own. And sure enough, in three years, I had my own warehouse. It takes a while. It's not easy. 
Um, and first I co-located with a friend, and then I was able to lease my own, and, and now I have facilities in several states. But, um, but that's, how, that's how I did it. And, um, and sometimes you just need that little push, and my, my children were already older, and, uh, and I had my mom that could stay home, because it does, let me tell you, being an entrepreneur is 24 by seven. It's really hard work, it's not easy, and, and rejection is not easy, you know, when they say, no, sorry, not today. And so you keep knocking, how about today, you know? So you never give up. It's follow up, follow up, follow up. Uh, and that's what I do all day, the queen of follow up. But, um, but yeah, it is challenging. And there are days that I say, why? But then I see the rewards. It's so refreshing to see the fruits of your labor, uh, to see your employees, and then to see um, all the things that you can accomplish and, and the people that you meet and the networking. It's just amazing. Amazing. So, thank you. Great question. Any other? Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. We've got a little something for Betty to thank her for a wonderful presentation and an exciting learning opportunity. So Betty, from another great company. Yes. <laughs> the little ugly thank bag, you. thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to introduce Melissa Scrivan, who is Beta Gamma Sigma Manager of Member Programs and Events. Melissa? Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you for that inspiring talk about how you started your business. I think it's very important that we have women and minorities represented in the business world today. Beta Gamma Sigma is an international honor society. We have 750,000 members all across the globe, and a lot of them are viewing tonight. Uh, we have people from Chicago, San Diego, we have people from Spain, all are tuning in tonight to hear this speech. And we want to thank you very much for taking your time to represent the Meet the Leaders of Business speaker series. Thank you. And thank you for coming all the way from St. Louis, right? Thank you. Thank you. And of course, our Meet the Leaders of Business speaker series could not happen without partners like Seton Hall University. Seton Hall University has a very strong Beta Gamma Sigma chapter, and they submitted a nomination for this event tonight and were chosen out of many nominations, and we couldn't be happier to partner with them on this great event. So thank you very much. And now to close, just a couple more thank yous. So I want to again thank Denise Oye and the Joseph A. Unanaway Latino Institute, the Financial Women's Association for being here, and especially my colleague Stephanie Halga for making sure that we made this connection. And of course, Beta Gamma Sigma. And I really want to say a special thank you to Lee Onimus, who was actually the individual, she is our Beta Gamma Sigma chapter advisor, and she took the initiative to get this event involved as part of the Meet the Leaders in Business series, and so we're very appreciative. And then finally, last but not least, thanks to all of you who came out tonight to celebrate this occasion. I want to mention one other event that I hope you'll attend. So next week, I don't know if you've heard of our Voices from the Hall series, but next week will be the New York City edition. And we're gonna have a panel of experts who are gonna talk about the changing landscape of Wall Street. So that'll be Jim O'Brien, who's an alumnus with Napier Park Global. And he's going to be joined by our faculty phenom, Tony Levisic. So if you'd like a great networking opportunity and a chance to learn more about the changing landscape of Wall Street, 
That will be Tuesday night, 6 to 8 p.m. in the Rockefeller Center area of New York City. It is free, I'll say it again, free. So all you have to do is register on the web. All right, so thank you everybody for being here. Have a great night and go Pirates.